So thank you so much, Kerry, for agreeing to be on the Mortgage Fund podcast. Oh, it's lovely to see you. It's, you know, I love podcasts because you can actually, you know, I, I know that people are listening, but I can actually see you. And it's such a nice, it's such a nice thing. I like the podcast world. It's a very friendly, nice world. It is, isn't it? And I feel like you really connect and like you get to know people on such a deeper level because you talk about real stuff on a podcast straight away. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I've really enjoyed doing mine, you know, the last kind of two years. I can't believe I'm saying two years. Is it two years? Well, I mean, well, probably just just under because it was, we started it on the first lockdown, which is, you know, a year and a half ago, isn't it? Yeah. So I just can't, I can't believe it really. But I, I've, I do love it. I love talking to people. I love, you know, like exactly what you said, you get to, you get to just kind of have a chat with people that you wouldn't perhaps get to chat to. And I exactly. really do that. Yeah, well, thank you for being on ours. Um, you're a completely different guest than we've ever had and probably our most high profile. So we're really excited. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of lots of people that are excited about it. So um, one of the things we're trying to do is interview what we would call inspiring women in and outside of our industry. Um, and you are definitely that. So I want to find out a bit more about your story, really, and how you've come to be the Kerry Ellis you are now so how did it all start how did you know you were talented tell me right back from the beginning um so I, I mean I was just a a local I went to a local dance school when I was a kid you know like most young kids do you know their parents find them something to do as I'm a parent now and finding things for my kids to do you know one of them does football and one of them does uh, like a fun club thing and it, it I, I think I probably was just put into a dance school like lots of other little girls and boys when when I was younger um probably it's just a little something to probably wear me out I think <laughs> and I just fell in love with it I I the, I mean I don't obviously remember I was I started when I was like three or four and I don't remember oh, right. it as such but I do remember like the hall that I danced in and the teacher and my, the friends that I was with. And I, I have kind of vague memories of it. So it must have sparked something in me that, that I was passionate about from a very, very early age. Um, and now I look back on that and I, I feel very grateful to have had a passion so early on because I think yeah. young people now, they don't, know, they don't know what they wanna do. They don't know what they wanna be. Yeah. And they've kind of lost sight of what makes them tick, what excites them and what options are out there. And I'm constantly saying to young people, if you could be anything, you know, <laughs> what you ask a kid when they're five, if you could be anything, what would you be? And they're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You know there's, too much, there's too much in the way. And I feel very grateful that I had that kind of clear um, passion when I was younger and it it took me through to where I am now and, and still does still ignites that joy and that drive and it's a it's a very difficult industry but I love it and I think that's that's what's got me yeah. to where I am I think so yeah lots of dance schools lots of I went to a drama school um, did lots of shows along the way um worked a lot and then when I left college I I literally just jumped straight into it and went went from job to job so when you say you went to um the school is that what age was that that you went into drama school the drama school at 16 so I left I left school in fact I was just I, last night I was talking to my friend's daughter who's just turning about to turn 18 doing her A-levels and you know and I was talking she's talking about how difficult it is and and how much pressure a levels are and I'm like but what do you want to do and she's like oh I don't know maybe you know buy buy clothes or be you know be a buyer or something and I'm, I'm and I didn't even for me it wasn't a levels and and that wasn't even a an op not an option but it wasn't on my radar I was like how do I get into this injury industry as fast as I can doing what I want to do and so you just and always I, knew yeah I mean I didn't know exactly what way it would happen I didn't know that I wanted to be in musicals as such I didn't know that I wanted to be uh, you know doing all the things I am now I just knew I wanted to perform and and sing and act and do it all I wanted yeah. to be creative I think and, and drama school was a as a way in in for me so I left at 16 and I went straight to drama school did you have to audition for that yeah quite brutally we 
we had, um, you know, got taken up to London by my parents for two days. We had to have a um, full day of like doing, you know, jazz and ballet and tap and all of that stuff. And you had to re, uh, do a piece, you had to sing a song, you wow. had to uh, do a little workshop. And then you also had to have a physical to see if you were even, if your body was even capable of sustaining wow. dance through the next three years. Um, wow. Which was all good. So I got through that. And then, um, because drama school isn't, you know, you have to pay to go, um, there was no way that my parents would have been able to do that. So we then, ha I had then had more auditions with the with the council and to try and get a grant so that we could get help and support. So wow. I did all that again in front of a grant system. And it, it was quite... It was quite brutal, but I'm so grateful that it happened because so you got it, got the grant, got the grant, got got the drama school place. Only got one drama school place. I went for a few, didn't get the others. Only got one. Wow. Um, but yeah, just really grateful for that training and for the support from my from my parents to allow me to do it and and go and support it because it's not the most um, traditional route either. Of uh, you know when your child says that. 16 I want to go to drama school you think well yeah but so does everybody you know so do yeah people. and the yeah the success rate is so small and they they trusted that I was going to do that and they you know they helped believed me. in you yeah, they helped me do it so how did you know you were talented because obviously there's so many people that go dancing and there's so many people that want to sing but quite honestly can't you know it's a gift I, I believe that you can um, obviously make better but it is a gift how did you, when did you know you had that gift I don't think there was a, a light bulb moment as such I think like I've you know just said it, it was more about my passion and drive for it it wasn't a case of me going oh I have a talent it was more I love this Okay. And I want to do this, so I'm going to make this work. I'm going to make this happen. Yeah, and that still happens now. You know that that's I I still don't go. Oh, I'm brilliant, and I'm you know I, I don't. <laughs> that's not how I think. My my brain is oh, maybe I could go and do a show here, or maybe I can create a podcast, or maybe I can you know apply to do this job or to do that yeah. show. So I'm always. It's more about the creation as opposed to the talent driving the talent drive that's interesting just in itself for me to hear that yeah. um and so you've gone to drama school and then obviously you're thrown into the industry right does that how much does that actually prepare you does it prepare you for the because the industry is hard right it is yeah it is it, it's quite brutal um it's because you get told no a lot you know you have yeah. to be pretty thick skinned or or well supported I think to to deal with the kind of emotional ups and downs of people don't want you you know yeah <laughs> you kind of separate yourself emotionally from from the reality of it's not it's not you as a person they don't want it's just that you don't fit you don't fit that particular mold for that particular job and that's fine um so yeah it it, it does prepare you in a sense that the training does so literally for three years I danced sang and acted like it, I breathed it every day of my life for three years um so in a sense that was a preparation of this is how it will be when you're working because yeah. this is what you'll be doing you know be super physical and you'll be your brain will be switched on you'll be learning lots of stuff you'll be thrown on at last minute's notice those kind of things you're prepared for there was lots of things you weren't prepared for like the just the knowledge of how to get a job, how to get an agent, how to find auditions, how to navigate when you're not working, how to do your tax bill, how to, you know, yeah. get support when you're touring, you know, those kind of things you have to learn on the job. But, um, but as far as training and actually doing the job, they do prepare you for it. See, that's really interesting. I wonder why that is there is that gap there because to me that's the most important stuff I I, I guess because you're trained to do everything else how they want you to do it right once you get a job I agree I mean it might be it might be slightly different I mean I went to college nearly 25 years ago but I don't reckon it is to be honest no I I 
But I think that, you know, having, having young kids of my own and watch, and suddenly being aware of the school system and the education system, yeah. you question a lot of that as well. I mean, I, I question a lot of the education system, probably because I'm from a creative lifestyle. Yes. But I question, you know, why do we not give our kids the tools to work a computer or to yeah. get, put them in a drama class so that they can interact with each other, so that they can yes. talk to people, put them in a in a sport more, do more sports so they're physically aware of their well-being you know, yeah really those things are, are, are fundamentally so important and yeah. they kind of get quashed at school so I think it's just the it's, it's the a system quite, it's quite an archaic I don't know if that's the right word it's quite no a, yeah I think dated system it is I mean it's one of the things we talk about like when you're a teenager you need to learn about property and mortgages and and Absolutely. tax and stamp duty Absolutely. and credit scores and you don't you no, just no. do not know and there's no. so many grown-ups as I call them even though I am one there's so many grown-ups that don't know this and no. adults so yeah that's why I was so curious as to you know having been in I've been in auditions myself um, and probably I'm definitely the most naive person in the room and it I always wondered, you know, do you all know the secret? Yeah, no, and no. I just don't like, is this an inside club that I'm out of? But it sounds like it's like, no, you just, you just do it. And you kind of pick up your own experience. Same though, isn't it? Because I think we could arm young people better. We could give them, we could give them better information so that they, they can make better choices. Yeah. Not the young people just don't know what's out there. So they don't know oh, maybe it might be a good idea to get on the property ladder a little bit earlier, or it might be good to find a different job that's not your, you know, that you don't, you haven't heard of before. They they don't have that information. No, they don't. They just are fed with things they need to buy in order to be cool and happy. Exactly. And that's the number one priority for them, exactly. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I have to ask, do you, did you ever suffer with nerves? Oh God, yeah, I still do. I mean, do I think, you? I think nerves is just a part of of life, and and especially in what we do because we stand in front of people and do do thing do crazy things that isn't normal. You know, we I stand yeah. and sing, or I stand and talk, or I stand and dance, or whatever it is in front of thousands of people, which is it's not normal. <laughs> it's not um, normal. So yeah, I do get nervous, but I don't mind getting nervous. I think I've learned to deal with my nerves um, because for me they're a good thing for me they're just adrenaline and it, it means that I care about what I'm about to do it means that it, again it's that passion igniting in me if, I'm, if I get nervous it means I'm excited and yeah. ready, for the, ready for the challenge as opposed to I'm so nervous this is going to overtake anything I can do um, yeah, so I wonder if that's where you just did that from a young age or if that's just the person because you strike me immediately I can sense your energy is re- you you've got high energy naturally positive like you can just sense that from someone quite quickly so it might just be your natural disposition or whether it's because you've just naturally followed that path from a young age when it is easier definitely when you're younger isn't it not to have that insecurity and not to have that yeah. second voice that can drive you basically if you listen to that absolutely I mean I've had I have had incredible nerves in auditions or for, for performances that have been heightened yeah but, but I've always come out the other side you know and, and and I've always kind of got through it so I think just age and experience maybe of just living through those those experiences and moments that you go well I survived it and nothing happened so it's okay so I think when it happens yeah. again I can rationalize it and go it's gonna be all right it's gonna yeah. be fine don't stress if anything it's a good thing and and how about after lockdown the first performance you did after lockdown how did that feel was that a did you go back a little bit and have to kind of re-remind yourself because once you get off that train is it different yeah I think I was I was quite I was quite proactive through the lockdown, as I'm sure you're not surprised to hear. No. <laughs> so I got busy and I, I did things like, obviously, my, my podcast and my book and sold my albums and I did a few little live streams from home. So I was I was active. And that was more so for, for me, creatively, keeping that 
side of me going because I think without that yes I'm a mum and I'm a wife and I'm a sister and a daughter and and all those things but without that part of me that creative part of me I feel like I'm there's something missing you know there's yeah. a very big part of me missing for me I had to keep that going in some some sense and I did a couple of um we did a couple of live streamed shows like I did one at the Coliseum uh where they where we filmed it with a band no oh, audience, wow which was really strange oh yeah um and I did one at the Palladium for Night of the Musicals or something that they they televised. Um, so I did I did a few things. I didn't do lots, but I did enough that it, I wasn't just out of it for a year and a half. Fine. So I think just having those moments of, you know, excited nerves, performance. It wasn't it wasn't that immediate huge big audience at all, but it was keeping me going. It was kind of almost like I don't know, just keeping my hand in as such. Yes. And then, from the first, when the first lockdown kind of released a little bit, I did a couple of um, like outdoor, socially distanced um, uh, performances at, at a what was it? It was an outdoor, outdoor castle, and I did a. And it was, you know, there was it was a, there was an audience, but they weren't huge. Yeah, they were set spread out. So again, I was kind of doing it. I was so that by the time when it did lift and things did start to pick up didn't feel like I'd, I'd left or I'd had a big okay it wasn't that moment of whoosh you know here we go I mean I did I did perform at the the Albert Hall uh, uh oh, wow that's amazing a couple of months ago and that was the first time to a full kind of packed audience and that was electric just because the right. energy in the room for everybody everyone that was on yeah. stage in the audience was electric um and that venue is special, isn't it? No, the venue's amazing. I I love performing there. I perform there quite a bit, and it never gets old. It always feels like a sense of occasion. It's very special. So to come back and do a big show there, yeah, was was wonderful. It was just so brilliant. I have to say, I love how you literally just threw out, you know, I started a podcast, did a book, did an album, you know, sent those out. Like, like that's like doing the laundry, the grocery. It's like, they're like major things. So we're going to give them a bit of time. Like, right. When did you write the book? Did you write the book in lockdown or was the book coming? What? Yeah. Yeah. So um, a, a lovely lady called Kelly Reynolds uh, contacted me about four or five years ago yeah about four years ago and uh, got in touch with me and she was like I'm a book writer I'd love to you know collaborate with you and and write your story and I was like oh no no I'm not you know I don't want to do that I'm not old enough what are you <laughs> going to read about me you know whatever and I kind of said it's really kind of you it's lovely to meet you but you know kind of no thank you and anyway we kept in touch and she sparked obviously something in me that yeah. went oh maybe there is a maybe there's a maybe there is a first chapter or, or a first act or a first half for me to, to write. And then in, when the lockdown was fully loaded and we were literally couldn't go anywhere, I contacted Kelly and I said, look, um, never written a book before, obviously, as you know, and I know I've said no, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit still for a couple of months, it seems, you know, will you help me put this book together? Um, and she was magnificent so we really? would talk literally like this on zoom for a few hours a day most days going literally back from when I can remember to to the to the lockdown yeah um, and it was it was so brilliant and it was so so much fun going over all them stories um and and putting it down on paper and and, and kind of mapping out this this book um and and yeah it's it's done now it, it, amazing it's done and it's um it's on amazon at the moment uh pre-order and it's due to i think it's going out end of this month early next month and we're going to do a little book tour and go and sign amazing and stuff. It's, it's funny it's what's strange about it is finally sharing the, the the side of the story that people don't know so lots of people know my wikipedia journey you know of my course. journey yeah um, but lots of people don't know what goes on alongside that. So uh, they know that I'm probably married and have two boys because I talk about it all the time. But they yeah. don't know that, you know, when I was w- in Wicked, I 
nearly lost my voice and had to see a surgeon and had to really uh, you know I didn't get any sleep and I was on and off the show with stress and oh they don't know that uh you know when I was touring um again doing my anthems tour with Brian again I was under a lot of pressure and it you know I couldn't speak for days on it you know so it's that I wanted to to yeah. share um, and also my my early days my younger days of how I actually did navigate into into the industry so yeah oh that's that's I'm definitely going to be reading that and that's kind of where I want this interview to, where I wanted this interview to go as well because like you say anyone can go on google and wikipedia and on your website but it's I want to know what goes on behind that brand you know because that's the stuff that people maybe don't get told to talk about or just don't want to or just don't have the opportunity to because you're so busy doing all the other stuff so I think that's great that you're telling a bit more authentically about what happens behind the scenes. You lost your voice. Yeah. yeah. You know what's the, the bit that's scary though for me to share is is not actually anything to do with me. Like I'm I'm kind of I think when you make the decision to put yourself in in this industry where you're putting yourself in front of people, you're putting yourself on social media, you're mm-hmm. on, maybe on the telly at some point, you're on the radio, you know you're choosing to put yourself there. So that whatever you get back is your responsibility, which I'm okay with. I'm okay with all of that. Yeah. What, what was quite, quite uh, what I'm slightly nervous about is sharing the stories of my friends and family. Because ah. I've done that before and I've not really, that's suddenly you have a responsibility of, like I, I, I let my mom and my dad and my, my husband I re- let Brian read it and um so ver- the various people that are in the book have read it which is which is They're happy you suddenly feel a, a responsibility for sharing somebody else's experiences you know yes. so that for me was I was like oh I'm not sure how I feel about this but I think with a book exactly like you say you need to be open and honest and there's mm. no point in writing it if you're just writing facts and figures that people already know about you've got to you've got to share yourself so yeah that's interesting (laughs) yeah that's interesting it's less about you and more about you I suppose sharing other people's kind of inside information as well yeah absolutely so that is interesting to me but I'm excited about that because I like yeah I like I want to know about that stuff myself so the book's out so have you held it in your hand is that weird I haven't no you haven't oh yeah it's all on my computer and because it's on pre-order obviously it goes out in the ether somewhere yeah but I haven't had a, a hard copy yet so that'll be oh, that'll be really special yeah. really special and then the album did you say you did an album in lockdown as well or was the album coming I out before album, yeah I did an album just before the lockdown called um feels like home and it was um I self-published uh, self-produced this album um so I've done albums in very various different ways I've had big labels I've been I've done an independent album with Brian on his label I've done a crowdfund I've I've produced them myself I've you know anywhere any which way I've done them and I wanted to do something because I was going on tour around the country and doing lots of um lots of my own shows I wanted something that I could sing for starters and something a bit old school of when you go to a show and you can get the album and take it home you know yeah. and it's awesome just click a button and you listen to it so I, that's that was my plan so I did it made this album really proud of it and <laughs> lockdown hit so I was like I've got all these boxes of albums <laughs> you don't normally have you know normally no. you go to a distributing company and so I had all these boxes of, of my album in the garage and I was like oh what am I gonna do <laughs> oh, no. so I put it I just I put this little message on Instagram at the beginning of the lockdown saying look you know guys I'm really sorry I can't tour and I made this album and I'd really love to share it with you but I don't just want to upload it on iTunes I'm gonna I'm gonna put it on my website so if you want a copy you know give me a shout and I'll write a little message and I'll send it out well I mean it went mental I became like a little shipping service and I was shipping from, from home and we couldn't go anywhere literally so I was kind of I was buying all the um the postage and the envelopes and getting them shipped to my house and literally going across the road to post you know when you can do your half hour exercise on yeah for my, <laughs> my album wow and it was so amazing and it's it's been a really nice 
kind of journey that of having yeah. pictures from the recording to actually sending them out myself, writing to people, sending them out and getting so many lovely message, messages back. And that's been really lovely, really lovely. So yeah, I've got a few left, but once they're gone, they are literally, that's it, they're gone. That's, they're gone <laughs> and they're not going to upload it. I I might do once they're gone, maybe. Yeah. I quite like that that because lockdown I think kind of simplified life a little bit and you even took the music back to the simple times of I like this and I'm going to listen to a CD and purchase it I know and it does my husband some has it in his car because nobody really the CD players not as many people have them anymore no have them in their car so my husband has it in his car and it's if I get in his car to drive it (laughs) breaks my heart that occasionally he's listening to it like, oh that is so sweet I love that <laughs> how old are your boys they're about to turn eight and six so you had the homeschooling going on as well <laughs> <laughs> so yeah they're like they're they're um, very similar ages to mine mine are eight and five so oh I know what your life looks like firsthand <laughs> it's quite oh it's lovely it's so lovely isn't it the ages but it's they need you they need you a lot so how did you how do you manage that with show business and how did you manage that when you had them full time um well I mean lockdown we're usually so busy with my husband and I are literally high-fiving each other our, <laughs> our child care is a constant nightmare because because it's always changing, our, our hours are always changing. I might be away for like a week and then I might be around for a month and then I might be off for, you know, two nights here. And, and it's really difficult to get people to help us. We have an amazing family that do help, but they're not yeah. down the road, they're not across. So we're, it's always a bit chaotic. Um, so lockdown was, it had real bonuses that we all just stopped and we were together as a unit for, that period of time yes it was stressful of course the homeschooling was oh my god I never ever want to do that again in my life no me neither that was stressful but actually as a being at home as a unit and not having to go anywhere and not being able to go anywhere was actually really nice we could have dinner together we could go go on walks together and we could just go back to those simple things that we were really active family anyway we would all take the dog out and we would those kind of things I really enjoyed and I think yeah. benefited and thrived especially the little and Freddie as a family we really kind of bonded um but yeah it also had its challenges because I mean I think for everybody to be locked up for that long without anything else going on is yeah really, it's really difficult and and although the boys took it in their stride as I'm sure your kids did too they live in the moment they don't really I'm not sure it's going to affect them until later. Years uh, later. They just yeah. live in the moment. Kids go, all oh, right, okay, we're staying at home today. Oh, okay, I'm going to be a pain while like while we have to homeschool. But then I can just be at home. They, they have, they don't have that worry or that stress of what's, what's going to happen. happen. No, they don't. No, so, they don't do the what if, do they? No, I'm not sure that they were particularly affected. And also the going in and out of school. Um, you know when that was kind of coming and going they just got on with it I'm quite lucky that they're they're quite um quite confident and they're they don't really they, again they just do they don't really take things um to heart too much they just get on and do with it so yeah but they are very lively <laughs> <laughs> so they've got and, the high energy oh my god so yeah they, it had its it had its ups and its downs if you like <laughs> and is your husband in this in show business as well is no my husband works in football so he coaches um oh okay coaches football he works at um west ham now he, but he used to work at luton so it was very close but he's just changed and gone to west ham so he has a crazy job as well he works he's got a big career too so it's 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 mental <laughs> yeah and are the boys do either of them look like they're following in your footsteps my youngest might um he goes to a little uh club called or, or a club, um, school called meal dale which is like a little um it's a college actually it's a, it's a theater college but they do like um weekend classes for kids so he oh, goes okay and he does he does love it and he's He's very, he sings around the house and he's, he'll move to music. So there's definitely something there. He quotes movie, you know, 
uh, quotes and says things if he's heard it quite uh, quite well. So th th there's definitely something there, but whether he goes on to do it, I don't know. No, it's too soon to to say, but you can nurture that because you know how to do that, right? Does he? Do they get impressed by what you do, or is it just no. normal? They don't. No. So if you're like, I've just done this, and look, I've got a CD. They're like, cool, mum, um, yeah. They the only uh, the only time it, it they were, I think they were impressed, or they, I don't know, they had a bit of a moment. Was in in the lockdown, we I did something for I can't remember when it was. I think it was one of the um when one of the songs came out that Brian and I redid in lockdown called Panic Attack. And we uh, redid yes. it in, um, in the lockdown. And I was doing an interview, I think on breakfast television or something, but I was in the office doing this interview because everybody had to do them on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. So I was in the office and my they had it on in the kitchen. So they were watching me in the kitchen and then that freaked them out that I was there in the <laughs> office. But yeah. That, they don't, they don't really care or they, or, or they just don't really they don't question it it's kind of just what I do and this they is normal they don't think anything different it's weird yeah it is it, it, it's interesting to hear because I think even Beckham's kids say that and you think really like your dad is David Beckham no. like your mom is Victoria they're Beckham they're around it from they're around it from day one so they yeah. don't really, like my kids were I mean, I, I sang through both pregnancies, so I was performing through being pregnant. And wow. then by the time they were born, I was taking them on tour. So they were in and out of theatre. Really? And, and they were on tour buses. And so for them, it, it, it wasn't anything special because it was just normal. That's amazing, though. I'm thinking, wow, that they is... Like when they're older. They might yeah. think it's cool when they're older, maybe. Oh, you're going to have so <laughs> many stories. That's... <laughs> Yeah, you will. I mean, even this, there's so many stories to dive into. But yeah, you'll have so many. I'm sure that they'll they'll appreciate it more as they get older, for sure. What's the best job you've ever had? Because you've done so much, like Broadway, West End, like TV, Brian May, singles. Like, but what has what's been your your highlights that you felt like? Oh wow, yeah. yeah there's there's lots. I mean, I'm always grateful to do. To just be working really and to do, be doing a job that I love doing yeah um, and I like that there's so many different elements to it that one day I could be you know singing Defying Gravity with an orchestra at the Albert Hall and then the next day I could be doing a, a podcast or be on the radio or be doing yeah. a voiceover. I love that it's always different and I like that I like the variety um so I'm I, I don't know there's Broadway was obviously massive because it was a bit of a, a childhood dream. Well, so. Yeah, that's surely. That's pretty big. Um, but, like, you know, my first West End show was a big deal. Um, that was My Fair Lady. And, again, I just didn't think it would happen that quickly. So to suddenly be in this big West End show and it all be happening was quite a moment. Um, do, do you remember getting the call? To say yeah, got I the do. I do, actually. I remember because I went up, I had three auditions um, or four auditions and I was actually being seen for ensemble um, with, yeah, an ensemble with a possible cover. And I got, eventually when I got the call, uh, I, my agent said to me, oh, they, they want to give you swing, which is when you kind of cover all the ensemble roles and you're, if one of the ensemble people go off, you go on, you know, so you learn lots of different tracks. So I was like, that's amazing. And he went, and they also want you to cover Eliza Doolittle, which was the lead and being played by Martin. Oh my Jackson. gosh. And I was like, oh my God, you know, that kind of <laughs> blew my mind. And they're like, you probably won't go on, you know, she's, she's gonna, there was a lot of excitement around her because she'd just come off the telly and she'd just done an album and there was a lot of hype about her. And I was like, wow, okay. But not thinking that I would even, get a go at it or maybe get a go at it in a year's time you know once we've been in the show for a year and literally within previews like the first few weeks I was thrown on doing this role that I really it was those moments that I go hang on a minute how is this happening how am I here I, you know before you can even digest it of what's going on you'll stand opposite Jonathan Price singing I could have danced all night going what <laughs> what's going on <laughs> wow so you must have like a tube a, a switch that just gets you on stage and does it 
and then just your, your actual brain <laughs> kind of so, goes oh my gosh I'm doing this at the same time yeah, I think a lot of times you do a performance and you come off the other side and go I almost don't remember what's just happened and I don't know if that's like if that's adrenaline, if that's your, if exactly that, if it's your brain just clicking into, you know, this former mode now. Yeah. And the emotional side kicks in after and go and, and kind of uh, realize the, 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 what you've just done. Yeah. Um, I think it's like my boys, you know, I've been doing it from such a young age that there was no, it was, there was no big dramatic jump, you know, it was a great. Yeah. I've been in my dance classes and then I went to college and then yeah, I, I see job. you're just adding layers aren't you yeah, as so opposed to stop. yeah I see that it's like your normal is other people's extraordinary but you've had that all the way through and yeah. just added layers so that's why even earlier when you were just like oh yeah you did, I did a book and this like you don't even know kind of the extraordinariness I guess so that's why when someone asked you if you wanted to a book you're like about what <laughs> whereas I'm like oh my gosh there's books out there from people that's done half as much and they've got three books so I guess it's a perspective isn't it it's where you've come from it's what you know um and you must see that more in your podcast because you interview so many different shades of of performers don't you I do and I love I love that I, I mean I've done bits of radio and stuff before but nothing like my podcast that was a real kind of moment for me to not be the person being interviewed and to be asking questions people like most of the people I know or I have some kind of connection with that was definitely season one they were all people I've, I'd worked with or had you know done shows with season yeah. two I started to reach out to people that I, I had a connection with but I didn't know as well so then to start to get to know them on a podcast was so interesting for me and again it, it wasn't something that I kind of sat and went right I'm, right my my show needs to have structure and like I would a show I would structure the song so that the, there's highs and lows and there's a yeah. and there's an end and with the podcast I didn't do that at all I I, I kind of sat down and went initially what what do I want to get from this well actually I, t I just want to talk to people and I want to I want like a performer to talk to another creative and yeah have a chat and see where that goes and that's how it how it worked and I loved that element to it that there wasn't any I wasn't trying to get anything from anybody I was just having a chat and yeah and to me, that was really interesting and then once the se first season went out people would obviously start messaging as you do and they're like oh, it's really good and you're you've got a flair for this and you could you know we're loving the chats and we're loving the topics that you bring up how do you come up with your questions da, da, da. so that was really really nice and really interesting for me because it wasn't it wasn't planned it was it was literally just having a chat and I, and that I thought this is this is really nice I hadn't even thought of this as an option before but maybe this is a journey that I can pursue yes. and I can progress with because it's something I really enjoy doing and I think that's yeah. going right back to what we said at the beginning when you've got a passion for something and when you've got an interest in something it's almost like it's not a job you just enjoy doing it and it takes you on this lovely wonderful weird journey that you're just invested in because you love it yeah that's what strikes me about you actually funny you took the words right out of my mouth because I was literally going to say just just then I think what people why one of the main reasons why you've done so well is because it's coming from an authentic place all the time so you're not picking things for the attention of it you're picking it for the intention of the fact that I love this and I think there's that the world that you're in is full of the previous that pit full of people looking for the attention don't even care what the intention is the intention is the attention like that's and then that comes from such a different place mm. um comes with so much psychological stuff around that well why why yeah. do you want the attention why do yeah. you need it is it going to be enough is it ever going to be enough yeah. Do you, yeah. you know what kind of attention do you need and want so that's what strikes me with you is it has come from the place of joy from day one and you've kept that and I think um, a lot of people have to actually teach themselves that skill in their lives and probably are still older and don't know how to follow their joy because as adults you kind of like lose that ability you stop choosing that so well when I met my husband we were 
we've been together nearly 13 years now and when I met him he was working in sales you know had a great job worked in the city and we'd been together for maybe I don't know maybe a couple of months and he was he was obviously starting to be surrounded by theatre people and creative people and we I I met him and then six weeks later I flew to New York it was literally just before I was going to do Wicked oh wow and we met and we I was like oh god this is really bad timing (laughs) you know you're great but I'm about to go away for six months and Anyway, he ended up coming out and flying out to see me and, and, and eventually the, his current job, you know, he was out c- coming to see me basically too much. And he, he I remember the conversation. We were sat on um, uh, in Central Park and talking about life and careers and this, that and the other. And he was like, but you just seem like you're, you love what you do and you're so lucky to have that. And I said, well, I'm not lucky to have a job that I love doing I found what my passion was and what I my passion drove me here I said well what do you love doing and he said football and I said well why aren't you working in football and he kind of went oh yeah so (laughs) amazing back from New York when he got back from New York he then started on this journey to become to work in football he played when he was a youngster but amazing out of it and not been encouraged to go if you love football, follow your football dream. It, you don't have to be a player. There's so many other jobs in football, but yeah, people miss out those opportunities to, to remind people what do you love? What do you what what sparks you? What drives you? Because we all know work can be really difficult. We've got to work for a living. We've all got to do our thing. And if you don't love your job, it can be really difficult and really yeah. tiring. And but if you love something, you'll go that extra mile and you'll, you know, you'll get up and you'll be ready to go and you'll want to go to work. Whereas if you do a job you don't like, that's going to be really difficult. Yeah, yeah. And it's <laughs> difficult even when you love it. Yeah, yeah that's it. And I, I imagine you have friends around you that really like get that from you, you know, that reminder and you've pivoted them or like your husband that you've pivoted them in a different direction because when you're around it, you can just feel it. You can just feel when someone's in their joy. You can. And I... I think because I'm usually surrounded by creative people that do love it. Some people don't love it, but you're, you kind of, you forget, you almost forget because you're surrounded. We're all having a nice time doing what we do because we love it. And we're, we're privileged to be there and we're grateful to be there doing, doing a real unusual job. Yeah. Kind of forget about it until, you know, that happens. You meet somebody that perhaps isn't. Isn't. And Yeah. That's stuck in the grown up world of not <laughs> saying you're not a grown up world, but you know that the the new story that you're taught is um and you know, there's two stories, isn't there? Follow your joy or do the duty, like earn the money or do whatever you need to do, like what you should do. So um that that is so inspiring, like that people hopefully will listen to this and think about their own selves and ask themselves, Am I living in my joy? Like, or is my joy you know, drinking on a Friday to get me through the weekend to start all over again. Because we all did that through lockdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> true. You feel better for it? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, exactly. Now you've got a song called Panic Attack mm. and I want to ask you about this. Have you suffered from panic attacks yourself? Did you write the song? Like what is the inspiration behind that? Obviously I'm imagining it's anxiety and panic attacks, but yeah. It, it absolutely is that. Um, so uh I was doing um uh, what was Golden Days which is the last album I did with Brian and we co-wrote a lot of songs on that we did some covers and co-wrote some new songs and he was he had the essence of that song um okay. he was out on tour um with Queen and it's amazing isn't it that somebody of that stature on a worldwide tour could have an insecurity have a panic attack have a you know um have that moment of fear yeah uh, doing it for as long as he's done it for you know being adored being the legend that he is and that he could go through with something like that so he came back off tour and was like I've got this kind of essence of this song and he kind of read me out some lyrics and he had a bit of a, a bit of a bit of a medley and uh, we we progressed it together um 
and talked about it lots. And we, we put it on the album and didn't really think too much about it. It, it got, we, we sang it on tour a little bit, but didn't really resonate. And then when the lockdown happened, I put it on one of my stories. I don't know what possessed me to do it, but I, I was just putting on um, you know, a video or whatever, and I tagged the song on. And Brian called me and said, you know, that song seems to have summed up what I reckon what a lot of people are feeling right now, that yeah. there's so much anxiety out there right now because nobody knows what's going on. Everybody's having that moment of panic in various forms, I'm sure, some more dramatic than others, some, you know, more effective than others. But everybody has that, is having that moment of, oh. Yeah. Um, I, I had it, I had it kind of early on in lockdown, maybe about a few weeks in, because I think suddenly the reality hit me of, because as far as I was concerned, I was still going on tour, I was still going to Japan, I was still doing all these things. And then literally, as we got to the dates and they were kind of disappearing, away. getting uh, rescheduled, I it started to to kind of uh, to resonate. And I do remember being at the kitchen sink and washing up the dishes and suddenly just starting crying. I didn't, I, that's not like me at all. I didn't no. know where it come from. I was like, what's wrong with me? And anyway, James kind of sat me down. I got on Zoom with a couple of my girlfriends and we chatted and it, and it was fine. I'm quite fortunate that I haven't really experienced it much more than that. Yeah. I know lots of people that do. I know, and Brian's quite openly, openly talks about his anxiety and depression. Um, and then he, he obviously brought this song up and then he said, well, maybe we can try and uh, put it out again, you know, do it something different with it and put it out. So we did a new video. I literally recorded it against my brick wall over there in my garden. Oh, was it that brick wall? Funny. <laughs> and and he did he did a little guitar solo in his loft. And we were going back and forth with a few little uh new lyrics and bits and pieces and we put it out and that was it really. It was just to kind of give people a bit of comfort. There was no agenda with it, just an acknowledgement of what's gone on. Yeah. And that's obviously that you know the news picked it up and, and stuff and and that was, the, I, I hope it gave some people some comfort. That was yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that's once again, the intention behind that was mm. the right one, you know, just, oh, I hope this helps somebody. And then it lands and tends to be what, what gravitates to, towards everybody, you know, and people resonate with it. I wasn't sure if it was you or Brian. I expected you to say the other way around, you know, if I, not to say I think you're anxious, but yeah, like yeah. you say, you wouldn't necessarily think it's going to be, you know, Brian May and that he experiences this. Yeah. yeah. But it affects everybody. It, it does it, affect everybody. And I think definitely the lockdown has highlighted it. And some people have, have benefited and come through it and other people have really struggled. Um, yeah. And it's not easy. Uh, but I think one thing that has come from it that is everybody, or, or I hope that people have realised it's more common than you think. I think absolutely it's just them and they're neurotic and they're you know overreacting and mm -hmm. it. but actually I think it's hit everybody yeah at a moment in some way and what's interesting is right at the very beginning um, of our chat you said with your nerves that you went through the process you let yourself feel it and then you recognize that it wasn't anything to be scared of so even though you feel them you your mind is trained to know I am okay and we are okay at the end of it and actually being an anxiety sufferer myself that is the solution to mm -hmm. panic attacks to anxiety is living through that feeling and knowing that you are going to be okay so that your yeah. brain recognizes and says it's okay I recognize this Whereas what we actually accidentally train them to do is go, this is scary. Uh-oh, 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 I'm scared. Yeah. It's so yeah. scary feeling. So it's really interesting that right at the beginning when you acknowledge that, I thought, oh, she's got this nailed. She already knows the secret. Like she's either read the same book as me or she just instinctively lived through it. And that then didn't develop into anything. Yeah. You change your mind. A lot of us, I think a lot of people on stage, there's a kind of thing that, everybody says that you know we're not saving lives and we're in a sense no we're not saving lives you know and if we what's the worst thing that can happen if I go out on stage the worst thing that can happen is I might forget my lines or I might you know 
say something wrong or or sing something wrong or mm-hmm. you know costume it's it's so I'm not in a in a surgery deciding whether somebody's life is in my hands or not it's not so I, I yeah. internalize it and go what's the worst that can happen the song's yeah gonna happen and I might not have done a good a job as I as I could have done you know that's yeah. okay it's okay we're only human it's, it's yeah really nice. it's giving yourself an easier ride I think definitely you've got such a lovely outlook I just I need a little bit of Kerry in my head sometimes just so I'm just gonna try and take inspiration I'm just thinking what would Kerry say <laughs> what would Kerry <laughs> think Kerry would say keep calm and carry on <laughs> yeah there you go keep calm and carry on well that's why you've obviously come up with it I get it all now I totally see it um so I'm very conscious of the time because honestly I could talk to you for hours it's I worrying it. <laughs> but um one of the things I always like to ask everybody because I'm collecting them myself is what is um, the biggest lesson you've learned in your life so far that you would share with myself and our listeners um that's a good question yeah you can take a moment to think (laughs) the biggest lesson is just to and it's and it's been more apparent to me over the the older I get and the more I'm grateful to to have the life that I lead, the, the people around me, the my friends, my family. I, I think you acknowledge it a little bit more the older you get. You know, when mm. I think when you're younger, you're a bit more carefree and you just kind of go through with things. And I think what I've learned along the way is 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 just to be kind, be kind to people, because kindness gets is is it's just such a nicer world to live in if you mm-hmm. if you're kind and people are kind to you. You know, I think especially over the last year, not just the lockdown, but all the things that have happened over the last year, you know, Brexit and the, the, the racial things that we've had, the, um, the news has been horrific. Yeah. And we just need to be a bit kinder to each other. And I think it doesn't matter who you are, what you are, what colour your skin is, what nationality you are. We just have to be a bit kinder to each other. And, and I think it, the world would just be a little bit of a better place. And it kind of sounds a bit hippie-ish. I do like no. my, my zen, but <laughs> I just, I think there's a bigger picture. And I think if you, if you go through life being a little bit more gracious and a bit, and a bit nicer to people, then it will, it will come back to you. And that I think is, is getting more and more important to me as I get older. Yeah, I like that. And actually, and um, being kind to yourself as well. Being it's, kind to yourself. It's like that kindness goes all the way around, right? Yeah. Um, if you're kind to yourself, you're going to be a better person. Yeah. Love that. Kind. Love that. Thank you so, so much um, for this and for today. Um, I'm going to put all the links to the book. Hopefully it'll be out by the time the episode airs. The album, hopefully I'm going to look, see that on Spotify because you've not got many left. So I'm, yeah. guessing, <laughs> I'm guessing they're going to go. Um, and when's your next live performance? Can people pay, like pay to see you anywhere soon? Yeah, well, Christmas is, I mean, I'm so excited for Christmas. It's going to be lovely and busy. There's lots of concerts. There's intimate ones at places like, um, I'm playing the Pheasantry early December, which is a really oh. little venue in London, Chelsea. And then oh, I'm lovely. doing big kind of orchestral concerts all over the country but it's all on my website so just if you want to see where I am and come and join me and sing a bit of festive fun oh <laughs> lovely yes well Christmas is my absolute favorite so lovely. I'll have a little nose <laughs> thank you so much Kerry um thank yeah you. can't wait for the book and thank you so much again for coming on the podcast thank you